understanding, used 160 times in 156 verses of the Bible, the intelligence and insight of both God and men. The cultivating of popular opinion has been used frequently in history to try to put down the principles of the Bible. Guess what? It completely fails every single time. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembert. I'm Janice. This is the Quick Study Television program. Thank you for joining us today. We're going through the Bible. And as we go through the Bible today, we land in this amazing passage of Numbers 16 to 18. Now, what are we talking about? This is Korah's rebellion. And today, we are talking about what the Bible tells us about the technology of rebellion. Oftentimes, uh, we don't know the difference in today's relativistic society between a freedom fighter and a terrorist. There's a reason for that, because we've lost our bearings. That and more coming up in just a moment. We'll look at that. Also, Corey is here with Bible Archaeology. Corey? Today, we are actually going to be taking a look at cities that are to be given to the Levites. So it'll Cities be of the Levites? Yes. Well, that's going to be Also cool. known as cities of refuge. And the Levites, of course, were the priest tribe, uh, and that's where the priests came from. Do you know? Do you know who Dathan and Abiram are? Dathan and Abiram. Yes. Okay, and it's not a new TV show mm -mm. Uh, that comes right from the passage that we're reading today. If it were a new TV show, it would be not a very good reality show because it didn't come out very well in the end. But that and more coming up. Also, stay tuned because we are going to tell you in this program how to get a hold of this. This is the Quick Study Wise Guide. Let's continue. Now, in Numbers chapter 16, the history of a rebellion from within the Levitical tribe, the tribe of Levi, um, is recorded. Now, this is the rebellion of Korah. He was a son of Koath, so he was a Kohathite. And uh, this rebellion is very unfortunate. It happens within the priestly class of the Levites. Uh, but what ends up happening is uh, out of this, there are regulations and rules for the Levites and provisions for them as well. Right now, you and I are going to take a look at a future provision, the cities of refuge. A fascinating feature of God's law expressed in the Torah is the allotments of land to be given to the Levites. The Levites were completely responsible for the holy things of the Lord and as such did not receive a normal inheritance. Instead, their inheritance was the Lord and cities were to be freely given to them by the other tribes. 48 cities were given, six being uniquely refuge cities where accidental murderers could run to for protection. Here they would be safe, but they could not leave until the death of the current high priest. Symbolically, his blood would count for the blood debt of the accidental murderer. Until the death of the high priest though, the walls of the city were your guide to life. Leave the city, leave your protection. Three of these cities of refuge were named by Moses before the takeover of the promised land. They were spread out on the east side of the Jordan River. Bezer was a city in Reuben's territory that would later have run-ins with Moabite King Mesha in the days of Ahab, Jezebel, and Jehu. Ramoth was the second city of refuge called Ramoth-Gilead. 
It no doubt saved the lives of many, but the willful murderer King Ahab was mortally wounded trying to recapture this city from the Arameans. Golan is a fitting name for the third city of refuge. It means enclosure. Kadesh in Galilee is the first city of refuge west of the Jordan. Its name means sanctuary and was the scene of the events of Deborah and Barak in Judges 4. Shechem and Hebron have long histories in the Bible, including Abraham, Jacob, and Joseph's travels, and Joshua renewing the covenant at Shechem. Both cities retained their importance for many generations. Together, these six cities provided man with a refuge, a safe harbor. Some might see it as a prison, but to those surviving, the psalmist's words ring true. Protect me, God, for I take refuge in you. It's time to study the wise guys in the Bible. They are all around us. Now, in the New Testament, Paul tells Timothy and Titus never to receive an accusation against a leader or an elder in the church except upon the testimony of two or three witnesses. But in the rebellion of number 16, there were at least 250 one on one Moses. Something's wrong with that picture. It's always Satan's way to use a mob against God's anointed men. When Moses was the wise guy, though, because he invokes God in this deal uh, to deal with the satanic mob. In this study, God gives us wisdom to understand the technology of man's rebellion against God's anointed. Numbers 16, 1 through 14. Now Korah, the son of Izhar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, with Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and On, the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took men. And they rose up before Moses with some of the children of Israel, 250 leaders of the congregation, representatives of the congregation, men of renown. They gathered together against Moses and Aaron and said to them, You take too much upon yourselves, for all the congregation is holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Why then do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? So when Moses heard it, he fell on his face, and he spoke to Korah and all his company, saying, Tomorrow morning the Lord will show who is his, and who is holy, and will cause him to come near to him. That one whom he chooses, he will cause to come near to him. Do this. Take censers, Korah, and all your company. Put fire in them and put incense in them before the Lord tomorrow, and it shall be that the man whom the Lord chooses is the holy one. You take too much upon yourselves, you sons of Levi, then Moses said to Korah, Hear now, you sons of Levi. Is it a small thing to you that the God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself, to do the work of the tabernacle of the Lord, and to stand before the congregation to serve them, and that he has brought you near to himself, you and all your brethren, the sons of Levi, with you? And are you seeking the priesthood also? Therefore you and all your company are gathered together against the Lord. And what is Aaron that you complain against him? And Moses sent to call Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab. But they said, We will not come up. Is it a small thing that you have brought us up out of the land flowing with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness, that you should keep acting like a prince over us? Moreover, you have not brought us into a land flowing with milk and honey, nor given us inheritance of fields and vineyards. Will you put the eyes of these men out? We will not come up. Numbers chapter 16, verses 1 through 14. In the West in today's world, it's all about what's popular. It's all about how big your audience is. 
Uh, that seems to be power. If your television program gets high ratings, you're powerful. If your political ideas are uh, allow you to get voted in, well, you're powerful. Uh, you've got political capital, so you're all powerful. So that's what today's world is all about. But that's not what God's world is about. See, God's idea has nothing to do with the popular vote. In the words of the great poet Emerson, just because the majority rules doesn't mean the majority is right. That's very wise. Actually, that's very biblical. Today we're going to study how a, an entire rebellion against God, how a culture of sin emerged inside the camp of Israel, and why that happened, and how that happened, and the technology of that rebellion, so that we can avoid it. Now this is very important. With that in mind, let's move into Numbers chapter 16, verses 1 to 3. Janice has already read it for you, but let's study it a little closer. Now Korah, the son of Izhar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, with Dethan and Abiram, the son of Elab, and On, the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben. That's the firstborn. So we have the Levites and the Reubenites. They took men... And they rose up before Moses, and some of the children of Israel, 250 leaders of the congregation, representatives of the congregation, men of renown, they gathered together against Moses and Aaron, the high priest that God had chosen, and said to them, you take too much on yourselves, for all the congregation is holy, every one of them, and we the people are holy, and the Lord is among them. Why then do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? You can almost hear the, you know, the hubris, that particular kind of arrogance. And beloved, may I say this? Here is a, a study-wise point to think about. Popular opinion has often been used to crucify the divine work of God in human history, but it has never succeeded. Now, I have good news. First of all, Emerson was right. Just because the majority rules doesn't mean the majority's right. He said that, by the way, from behind bars. He was in prison because he was protesting against the uh, racism in America. Very interesting. And the point being this, the point being that, that popular opinion has been used frequently to try to come against God's work in his church. But it's never succeeded, ever. So don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. It's more important for us to be accepted by God than be accepted by the culture. Keep that principle in mind. But wait, it gets better. Verse 4 says, So when Moses heard it, he fell on his face, and he spoke to Korah and all his company, saying, Okay, tomorrow morning the Lord will show you who is his and who is holy, and will cause him to come near them, that one who is that he chooses he will cause to come near him. Do this, take censers, Korah, all your company, put fire in them and put incense in them before the Lord tomorrow, and it shall be that the man whom the Lord chooses is the Holy One. You take too much upon yourselves, you sons of Levi. Wow. Now that brings me to this point. Study-wise point number two. Popular vote is not frequently a way to determine God's authentic leadership. It has many failings. We must recognize God chose men and women. Can I tell you that the most important vote of all is the vote of the Holy Spirit? <laughs> the vote of the Holy Spirit uh, it decides the leadership in God's church. It's not the vote of the denomination. Now, uh, votes and denominations are often designed to try to recognize the Holy Spirit's work. That's fine. But when we start mimicking the world systems, uh, to try to decide leadership, we will fail. Popular vote is free, not frequently determined in the Bible. It is the anointing of God that's recognized by His people and disciples. That's what determines. It is the touch of the Holy Spirit. It is the vote of the Holy Spirit that determines the leadership. Briefly, we go into verse 8 now. Then Moses said to Korah, Hear now, you sons of Levi, is it a small thing? To you that God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near himself, to do the work of the tabernacle of the Lord, to stand before the congregation to serve them, that, uh, and that he has brought you near to himself, you and all your brethren, the sons of Levi, with you. And are you now seeking the priesthood too for a power grab? That's my part I added. Back to verse 11. Therefore... 
you and all your company are gathered together against the Lord. And what is Aaron that you should complain against him? Wow. Here is our third study wise point. Popular ideas of lobbying for power to change leadership to our opinions are often judged by God, not rewarded by him. Politics in the church is a great desecration of the church. Politics in the church is a great desecration of the church. It is shameful. Shameful. And these men said, you know, Moses and Aaron, they're taking too much power on themselves. We want a power grab. So they went and they got the firstborn of Israel, Reuben's family, and they said, come on, guys, you join us and we'll, we'll gather a posse, a lobbyist group, and we'll get in front of everybody and we'll say, excuse me, we're 250 strong and we don't agree with these two guys over there, so we're going to take over. And it didn't work because in the end, if you read the story, God judged Korah and his rebellion and a lot of people died that day in the presence of God because they dared come against God because they tried to desecrate the community of God with the politics of man. It's always a mistake. We must stay close to the Holy Spirit. We must have the mind of Christ, an attitude of servitude, and stop trying for power grabs in the church. Today, you and I are going to look ahead in the scriptures just a little bit. In Numbers chapter 20, we're introduced to a group of people. We're introduced to the Edomites. Now, this is actually not technically an introduction for the first time within the Bible, but it is the first introduction within the book of Numbers. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the history of the Edomites um, and kind of travel with them through history. There is a lot of information packed in here, but it'll help us keep the story in context. Context. The region of Edom is a mountainous land south of the Dead Sea. It is rich in copper and iron deposits that have been utilized by the likes of Egypt and Israel. The Edomites, that is, the people living in Edom, were the descendants of Esau, the brother of Israel's founding father, Jacob. Though related to Israel, Edom has a rocky and violent history with their cousins. The Edomites did not allow passage through their territory to Moses during the Exodus. They fought with King Saul and were taken over eventually by King David. Even when they were a part of Israel, the Edomites often raided Judean towns and eventually they revolted. Like many people groups of the area and much of northern Israel, Edom was soon taken over by the Assyrian Empire. A few hundred years after this takeover, the Edomites were referred to by a different name, Idumeans. By 40 BC, many Idumeans had been converted to Judaism and one rose in allegiance with Rome to become the ruler, the king of Judea. His name, Herod the Great. Today, there is a great battle for the minds of men and women. Pop culture is lost in its do-it-yourself religion and feel-good values. But we believe that the Bible offers a better way to live. And although many have distorted the Bible's principles in order to slander its meanings, still millions are healed by the life it brings to our world. Quick Study Television believes it's important to present the Bible daily in our present culture. Your contribution to this ministry is used for that purpose, for the production, distribution, and publication of the TV program, the print guide, and the website. And we need your help. Will you help us this month especially? To write today and send your help, write to P.O. Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 156680150. 
in Canada and the rest of the world, write to P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2. You can also use our website, www.biblediscoverytv.com, and click on the Donate button. We've been talking about the technology of rebellion and there are people involved in that technology. Korah was one of them. He had some followers and uh, these people were interested in power trips. It's very interesting. Mm -hmm. it, with that in mind, as the context of the entire program as we study the book of Numbers, here is Did You Know or Do You Know? Do you know who Dathan and Abiram are? Okay, so Corey, here we have Dathan and Abiram, two specific mm -hmm. names mentioned in the Bible. Do you know who they were? Yeah, they were a part of the rebellion. They were they were leaders of the rebellion mm -hmm. as well, I believe. They I, were. I, I concur. They they they're clearly mentioned as uh, leaders of this rebellion. Two allies of Korah. They mm -hmm. absolutely were. They were also brothers. Um, they were the sons of Eliab. Uh, they wouldn't come and stand before Moses. Korah. And the leaders came and uh, accused Moses to his face. You take too much on you, Moses. Who yeah. gave you the right? That's yeah. what they said. Dathan and Abiram wouldn't even come when Moses uh, sent for them to call. They, they wouldn't have anything to do. They accused Moses, actually, of brutality. Do you know how they, they did that? They accused him by saying, will you put out the eyes of these men? Now, there's nothing in the story of Exodus that would suggest that Moses would even do such a thing. Mm -hmm. But th they just had to take it one more step that, you know, Moses would be so brutal as to, as to do the, putting the eyes out of these men who are rebelling against him. A lot of people try to take Moses and the culture of ancient Israel in the wilderness and say, see, that's just like they operated in Egypt. That's just like they operated in ancient Assyria. Moses does not strike them. But he says, okay, guys, let's put it before the Lord. Mm -hmm. Is that common among the pagan ancient cultures, Corey? No, not at all. Well, how did they change leadership? Uh, in so many various ways. Uh, but often, especially when, you, when you're when you taking a look at the legal codes, it often does involve brutality and mm -hmm. violence uh, to get a point across, which, you know, from a humanist standpoint, the more brutal you are as a human leader, uh, you're actually you could justify it by saying you're saving lives because then there won't be as many rebellions against you. But this is not the way that um, godly leadership is supposed to operate at mm -hmm. all. And we see that via Moses and Aaron. Okay, so but people say, well, you know, ancient Israel in the wilderness, they're just copying all the other pagan cultures. Yeah, no. Okay, so, so the question is, let's compare them briefly, just for a moment, for the sake of argument, the leadership of Sargon, Sargon II, and the leadership of Moses. Mm -hmm. Is this how Sargon would have dealt with the, the rebellion? Oh, let's just let the gods decide? Of Assyria, no. No, Sargon What did he do? Assyria, he would have tortured you. He would have tortured you. Mm -hmm. um, worse than death. Like some, some of the rivals would be killed and then others would actually be kept as uh, they would be mutilated and kept as pets um, on chains so that everyone could see what happens mm -hmm. to a person who. You mean to tell me they'd be subjugated the and like maimed and then subjugated, actually kept on chains? Mm -hmm. So, so Janice, if that's the case, then the end of this story where Moses says, well, let's let God decide. Mm -hmm. Uh, that is just remarkably different than, it, than Pharaoh, right. than any, any other, other culture cultures. of the day. Yes, very much so. And, and remember, I mean, we can be hard on the Israelites, but also keep in mind that they were coming from a very pagan culture. And so there were things that they had been involved in before, and this was why God needed to separate them and get them apart so that he could reteach them how to be. Yeah, it's, it's, it's easier to take the Israelites out of Egypt than it is to take Egypt out of the Israelites. Exactly. I mean, they've lived this way. They've seen this sort of Egyptian style mm -hmm. of, uh, of governing. And then as the pharaohs would come along and, you know, take over new kingdoms, they've seen this for 400 years. Mm -hmm. So now they go for 40 years in the wilderness. I think that's pretty, a pretty good success as considering it took one tenth the time mm -hmm. to deprogram them with the power of God. Very mm -hmm. interesting mm -hmm. about this, by the way, 
the end of the, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, Dathan means fountain or warring, and Abiram means my father is exalted. Just little tidbits to add on to the end. A fountain of war that my father exalted. Interesting. Uh, that, that's fascinating. Here again we have the names, Corey, and uh, this is all about learning the culture. See, there, there's a, just to, to close this segment out, important to remember that God is creating a culture of ancient Israel, and He's doing it in the wilderness without the involvement of other urban settings. That to me is interesting. He's going to eventually take that culture into the land of Canaan. All right, so it's time for a call to prayer. Let's pray and we'll study on. This is God's wisdom at work in our lives. You know, it's confusing to live in the end times. Nations and cultures around the world are struggling to gain control and power. Conventional wisdom may tell us to form special interest groups and collide with man's world. God's wisdom at work in us is very different than the wisdom of this world. You see, our Lord is waiting to answer our prayers. We would be wise to take our righteous concerns to the heavenly throne, not earthly powers. If God does not change the world, nothing will. Therefore we pray, Lord, help me not to place my hope in the politics of men and its systems, but teach me to pray and obey your word, bringing powerful change into this world. It is our commitment to go through the entire book of Proverbs this year, as well as the Bible. So today, in our Wise Up segment, here's the reading from Proverbs chapter 9, verses 7 to 8. Just a few from this passage. He who corrects a scoffer gets shame for himself, and he who rebukes a wicked man only harms himself. See, there are some people that no matter what you do, no matter how hard you try, they don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear about you. They don't want to hear about your God. They don't want to hear about anything. There's other people that are really looking and truly searching. I mean, I suggest to you today that the one you're searching for is Jesus Christ. You see, He changed my life and, and thousands and millions of other lives before me and also in this present day. And He asks you, what will you do with Him? He stands at the door of your heart and knocks. And any man who lets me in, He says, I will have fellowship with Him. How do you do that? So the Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verses 8 and 9, that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus be Lord of my life, and you believe in your heart that He's the Savior, can do something about your sin. He died on the cross and rose again to give you eternal life. Pray to Him today. He says, you will be saved. We need your help today. We're supported by viewers just exactly like you. Would you pray about supporting this program in any amount? To find out how to do that, you can go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com and click on the Donate button. Thank you in advance.